Okay, here we go, rolling on through frequently avoided questions. And today, we get one that is, can I say I'm excited about it? Because it's downright explosive. The other ones were too, but somehow it, it just, we don't argue about things quite as well as we do with faith and science when you put those two things together. And I love to get in and dig in on stuff that is explosive. And so let's just have some fun with it this morning. You th yeah, you th yeah, let's, yeah, let's have a great time. Yeah, because these conversations are usually a ball to have whenever you've had them in other contexts. Just people laughing, good old time. And that's part of the issue. So this morning, I'm going to start out by asking you a question. We're going to even take a vote on it because I want you to be bold in your beliefs. 2009. Maybe you remember this. There was a plane that took off from LaGuardia Airport, and almost immediately upon taking off, it runs into a flock of geese and goes out of control. And then the pilot, Chesley Sullenberger III, Sully, does all of these amazing things, all kinds of very technical things, one after another in a span of a couple of minutes, and the plane lands safely on the Hudson River, which is simply amazing. Do you remember this story? Well, it happened, and as soon as it happened, people started to say, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Th that this, th this can't happen. You, you run into a flock of geese, and you start to go crazy in a plane, and it is very difficult to keep a plane steady enough. It just it, This couldn't have happened on its own. God's hand was in it. It's a miracle. And okay, I'm cool saying God's hand was in that. Are you cool with that? That's pretty amazing stuff, right? But on the other hand, you got God's hand over here. On the other hand, Sully had been flying planes and gliders, and he had been training other people to fly planes and gliders and to work through exactly these situations for 30 years. So... Wasn't it just kind of a natural process? This happens. He finds himself in this situation. He's rehearsed it hundreds, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of times. So he just does what he's trained to do, right? It's a completely natural process. Can you get that? So let's take a vote. All those in favor of it was a miracle, raise your hand. Uh, about 50%, put your hands down. All those in favor of it was a natural process, raise your hand. All right, now everybody who voted twice, raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Because you're thinking, see, you get it. You, 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 there's something inside of you that instinctively says, can it be both? Does it have to be exclusively either it's God's hand or it's the hand of Sully or either it's God or it's nature, either it's supernatural or it's natural, does it have to be an either or? Is there any way possible for it to be both and? It's both God and it's this? Is, is that possible at all? Well, I think it probably is, but let me now ask you a new question. How old is planet Earth? Is it between six and 10,000 years old? Or is it billions of years old? Is it, let's start arguing. I'm kidding. Don't start arguing. Somebody in the Bay is billions of years old, somebody said, and somebody else is thinking, gosh dang it, it's 10,000 years old. And, and another question, how was it created? Was it created in six 24-hour periods? From nothing to the world as we now know it? Or... Was there a big bang, divine or otherwise, and then things evolved to the point where we have them here? Which one is it? Is it supernatural or is it a natural process? And see, you're thinking about Sully, and you say, well, well, can it be both? Can it? Because listening to people, over the course of my life, I would have a definitive no. I mean, yesterday or a couple days ago, I put on our Facebook page the picture, faith going on one direction and religion going on the other direction, 
and I just put in bold letters, does the Bible contradict evolution? It's supposed to be a provocative question. It's supposed to make you think. But then when I shared it on my own Facebook page, I put, this Sunday, we're going to talk about, is there a different way to have this conversation? And the response I got from somebody was, yes, it does. And I didn't even know what they meant. Yes, it does isn't a response to, let's have a different kind of conversation. And then I realized, oh, does the Bible contradict evolution? Yes, it does. And she even pointed me to somebody I should read, who I'm assuming proves that the earth was created over six 24-hour days, and the Bible absolutely does contradict evolution. But is there a different way to have the conversation? And I wonder, because my mind goes back to the first wedding I ever did as a pastor. I sat down with the couple, and she was a professing Christian, and he was an atheist. And I said, well, why? Why are you an atheist? And he said, well, I'm more of a science guy. Have you heard that before? I'm, I'm less of a faith guy. I'm a, I'm a science I'm a science-based person. And I don't think of myself as a faith-based person. I'm just a person. But there's some difference in his mind, clearly, between people who base their lives in science and people who base their lives in what he would call superstition. But it's not just the outsiders who do this. Think about it. I have been with countless numbers of people whose family members are sick with cancer or clinging to life from some other thing. And what do they say? We're praying for a miracle. We're praying for a miracle. And then if the person is healed, what happened? The miracle. The miracle they were praying for happened. And so the assumption is, right, that if you're praying, you're connecting with God who is up there or out there somewhere, and if what you are praying for happens, it's a miracle. God came down and, and touched creation, and boom, the whammy happened. But then where did God go? Back to wherever God was? Or something? But then, of course, what if what you're praying for doesn't happen? No miracle. No God. No nothing. So, in our minds, either God is doing miracles, or God is absent. Either it's all supernatural, or it's just a natural process. So in our own way, we're setting up the either or ourselves. Either God's doing miracles, or God is absent from the process, and things just roll on, they're established, and they just go. Both sides are doing it. So is there a better way to have the conversation? I heard in a pulpit one time at a church, big old huge Presbyterian church in the Atlanta area, and the pastor got up and he had the Bible and he said he had the solution. He didn't say he had the solution, but he gave us the solution. He said, science and the Bible, they exist to do different things. The Bible doesn't exist to give you the how of science. It exists to give you the why. Why are all these things happening? And then science doesn't exist to give you the why, it exists to give you the how. And as I sat there, I thought, dang, yeah, that's absolutely, I can totally buy that. But then I walked away and I thought, but wait a second. So that means that the Bible says nothing on how. So is the Bible just wonderful myths that point to a why, and then science gives us all the good, hard, concrete facts of how? And then there's also no why in science at all? Something was a little unsatisfying. And that, in its own way, was the all God. God is over here doing God's thing over here. And science is over here doing science things over there. And as long as they stay separate. But you see how we've set up this thing, the entire conversation. Because I know you've been involved in it at some level, or you've observed it from afar. The entire conversation is based on an either or supernatural, natural, God, science, Bible, evolution, faith, reason, whatever. Is there any way to have a different conversation? Because don't we need a different conversation? Because I bet you have just loved, loved when you're drawn into a debate about faith versus science. Do you like it? Your faces say you don't. 
but your voices say you really don't want to respond, maybe because you don't want to get into it at all. And of course, people outside the church are drawn straight to the, to the church through these debates, right? Yeah, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, otherwise I would have never believed in Jesus, but a Christian came to me and browbeat me about six 24-hour days, and I was sold on the whole thing. In the same way, I don't know a whole lot of believers who got there through being browbeaten by scientists saying it's evolution. We've got to have a different conversation. But where can we find it? Well, take a Bible. You all have them in the pews. And I actually made sure I had the same translation as, as in the pews. So when I read something, it's what you're reading. So get your Bible or get the church's Bible. Put it in your hand. That's step one. And I want to, you to open up to two things. The first is Genesis chapter 1. Because Genesis chapter 1 is at the heart of this whole debate, right? And then I want you to turn, keep one finger in Genesis 1. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. And I'm not going to assume anything about anybody, but it goes 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. You're laughing. <laughs> Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Page what? It's page 956. That's a little easier. If you need to go there. Page 9, thank you, Marilyn. Page 956. Now keep your finger in page 956, Colossians chapter 1, and look at Genesis chapter 1. The question we need to ask is, does the either or exist in Scripture itself? What does this Genesis 1 account exist to do? And the first thing, one thing I think that preacher who gave the, the how and why sermon was on to something, is you got to ask yourself what Genesis 1 exists for. Do you think? And one way to, to do this, I've had a lot of people say to me, I can't, I can't buy the fact that a serpent talked, which is in Genesis chapter 3. Is the point of Genesis chapter 3 that snakes talk? Do you think that's what the author wanted you to walk away with? Reading Genesis 3. You know what? I, I think snakes talk. And then you can argue about it. No, they don't. I've never seen a snake talk, but God could make anything talk. You've missed the point. What is the point of Genesis chapter 1? Is it to tell you how many 24-hour periods the world was created in? It's not, no. I mean, that's not why it exists. You could come to that conclusion through reading it, but that is at best a side note. What is the, the meat of it? What's the point? The point is to tell you truths about God and humanity, God and the world, and how those things interact with one another. So what kind of a creation did God set up? You can read the whole thing. We're not going to read the entire chapter 1 of Genesis together, but if you read it, God speaks into existence this world, and it's beautiful. We've said this before. It's good or it's very good, depending on where you're reading in it. But that's how God describes it. And note something, something that I didn't notice really until last week when I was reading about it. God speaks, and supernaturally the world comes into existence. But you see what kind of a world he sets up? He creates plants, and he says to the plants, now you have seed. Seeds that will produce plants after your kind. And then he produces animals and says the same thing. Be fruitful and multiply. And the animals will create more animals after their kind. And human beings are created. And he says, now you, be fruitful and multiply and create more human beings after your kind. So God speaks supernaturally. The world comes into existence. And then he sets up a natural process whereby that world will continue to create itself independent of him. Evolution proved, right? No. Because it would only be proved if God then went away. But he doesn't. He creates a world that can sustain itself and keep on reproducing, but then he stays in it. In the Garden of Eden, he walks at the time of the evening breeze, and he interacts with Adam and Eve, and he has conversations. So, heaven... God and earth are happening at the same time. They're together in a way that Genesis doesn't bother 
explaining. It just states that that's the way it is. There's this natural process going on, and there's this supernatural, and they're all woven together the whole time. If you were in the ancient world and you read that account, you would know immediately what was trying to be conveyed. Because all the gods in the ancient world created temples. That's what you did. If you followed a certain god, you created a temple for that god's presence and glory to live in. And so God was creating a temple, and the entire world was that temple, filled with God's glory. But also, if you were in the ancient world, you would know that every temple had to have an image of that God in it. And God did that too. Because what is the image of God in the temple of creation? What? Yeah, people. People, human beings, are the image of God. When you look at the human beings, you're supposed to be able to see the glory of God radiating from them. You're supposed to be able to look at people and see God's glory. But then, that snake talked, which is not the point. But Genesis 3 happened, and sin is introduced to the picture, and the whole thing gets smeared and blurred and distorted. The image of God is not what it's supposed to be. The image is broken apart, and creation itself is cracked and fractured and all these sorts of things. And so you see throughout the Old Testament this story play out. You may not have thought of it this way before, but the people go into slavery in Egypt, and they're struggling. Where is God? Where is God's presence? God's glory has left us. And what do they do? When they're rescued from slavery by God, they set up, at God's command, a tabernacle. Why? When Moses goes into the tabernacle, what is he talking with? God. God's glory. And he comes out and his face is shining because he's been interacting with the glory of God. So the tabernacle is where heaven and earth meet, where you can find God's glory and God's presence. Then they go a little farther down the road. They make it to the promised land. They get there. And what is one of the first things they build? The temple, because you got to have a place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells. And so the temple in Jerusalem is where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells. But then, again, the story repeats itself. The people are taken into exile. They're conquered. The temple is destroyed. So there is no place for God's presence to dwell. There's no place where heaven and earth meet. And the prophets start to talk about a new kind of paradigm, a new idea that there's going to be a Messiah, there's going to be a king, and in that person, somehow heaven and earth will meet. And of course, in the fullness of time, we believe that Jesus came. And now flip to Colossians chapter 1. And this is what the ancient church believed happened with Jesus. Look at verse 15. Do you have it? Page 96, right? Oh, 956. I'm sorry. There we go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image, is the image of the invisible God. The image. You hear that? The image was blurred, right? In Genesis chapter 3, the image of God set up in the temple of creation was blurred and distorted. But Jesus is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth, the meeting place of heaven and earth. On heaven, heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things in heaven and on earth, hold together in Jesus. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might, have come, he might come to have the first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. All things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. You see what's going on here? Jesus is the new temple. Heaven and earth come together and meet in Jesus. 
There is no either supernatural or natural process. There's no God is doing it or the natural process is doing it because heaven and earth, all things are brought together in the one Jesus who was fully divine and fully human. There's no 100% this or 100% that because Jesus is 100% everything. There is no either or. There's no sacred and secular. There's no beautiful and ugly. There's Jesus who stands in the middle of it all and holds everything together in himself. Is that a workable concept? It's impossible to completely understand and it's a total mystery, but do you at least understand what I'm saying? But what does it mean for us? Well, remember what Jesus did when he was raised. After he'd reconciled all things in heaven and on earth in himself through the cross, he's raised from the dead. And what does he do to his disciples? He breathes on them and gives them his spirit and says, go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've commanded you and, make, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he, in effect, sends them out in the world to do what we were meant to do in the beginning. If Jesus restored and healed everything, then the image of God that was in us that was blurred and destroyed is not blurred and destroyed anymore. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can go out into this world and be the image of God again. People can see God's glory through us because it's not destroyed anymore, it's not distorted anymore because of what Jesus did. So in us, through us, who are in earth and on earth, heaven itself, God's glory, can shine through us like it was able to at the first creation because of Jesus and the new creation that he brought to the earth. There's been a resetting of things and a healing of things through Jesus. And that's the point. That's the point. And what does it mean for the world? The either or that we base all of our conversations on literally does not exist. It's not there. Not from the Christian mindset anyway. There is no divide. There is no divide because God is through all things and created all things and because we're in the world and God's glory shines through us, this world is not separated. There's no line that goes through divine and natural or whatever. It's all together in Jesus. And we're held together in Jesus. And so, I won't lie, this stuff is fascinating. I like to dig down in it. Let's get scientific or let's take the Bible and let's, let's chew on human origins and the origins of the world and have a good time. Oh, I love these debates. But if that's the entire point, You've missed the boat. You've missed the boat. If you live your life trying to find where God is because God is not here, you've missed it. If you're waiting for God's miracle whammy to come, and if it's not, then God isn't active, you're missing God where God is working. God's fingerprints are all over the place. God is all over the place because God's Spirit is all over the place. And man, that's good news. So go out into this world and claim everything that is good and true and beautiful as God's own. Because it is. Everything in this world that is good or true or beautiful belongs to God, no matter where you find it. And you can find God in some crazy places. Like music, or art, or literature or science. Whatever is good or true or beautiful in the world belongs to God. So don't miss the point. Don't be drawn into a debate that goes nowhere. Don't chase your tails in an either-or world. Live in the world reconciled by Jesus Christ and show God's glory to everybody you meet in it. Amen.